most tools, probably 90 to 95% of them are using the OpenAI API. A few use the Anthropic Clouds API, but not very many. Every time you see an AI writer, a tool that does blog post writing or any type of writing, there it's ChatGPT. It's just a reskin. And welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew. And I'm your host, Brett Dicer. But this week, we're going to be talking about AI, the thing that all marketers are worried about, trying to figure it out, trying to do their best to use it in the best possible way for this stuff. But I have Jonathan Green with me, and he is an expert using artificial intelligence for your online business. And he's a best-selling author of Chat, Chat GPT Profits, and he has a mailing list of over 100,000 subscribers, and he hosts a podcast with 250-plus episodes. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Love talking about my favorite subject, AI. Yeah. And the first question I saw my guests is, are you a coffee or a tea drinker? Tea. Tea? I'm drinking, Any specific? Uh, I drink fruit tea. I find tea unbearable, like regular tea. So I drink like four fruit tea, fruit tea or mixed fruit. It's the only way I can do it. But um, yeah, I can't drink coffee. It makes me sick. So I have no choice. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, if it makes you sick, yeah, I wouldn't want, you, I want anybody to drink coffee. It makes them feel sick. But I gave a brief explanation of your expertise. Can you summarize it a little bit more for the, our listeners? Sure. What I do is help people to understand how you can use ChatGPT to improve your processes, to speed up your business, to be a little bit better at your job, to save time or money, and really focus on the implementation. It's very easy to get distracted by how technical it can get. There's Every day there's a new white paper about how AI works. It's not really useful. It's also easy distracted by all this new flashy features, which are interesting things, but not useful to you. So I try to kind of walk that narrow band of, is this practical use for entrepreneurs, small business owners, and people that are trying to grow their business or kind of grow their career? And in that case, there's a lot that AI can do for you that can really help you to be faster at your job, to save more time, to cut down on your costs and really increase your efficiency. because I can tell you for my business, it's a lot easier to save a dollar than it is to make a dollar. That's actually pretty true. I mean, making a dollar is, especially now in this inflation rate, <laughs> it's making people go, should I actually spend that money for the AI or whatever else that you actually need them to actually buy? So I agree with that. But since we're talking about AI, is your favorite tool Jet, Jet GPT or do you like bard or whatever else is out there that i don't even know about i just got really good at chat gbt first so i became a power user and once you get really good at one it's hard to justify jumping to another one i also have claude i also have perplex i was going to switch to claude because it has a longer memory and then chat gbt released an update last week that i'm a big fan of perplexity for research perplexity is up to date so it does research that's all the way through today because current internet research it's really good for that the thing chat gb stinks at and chat GPT did just change their time window it used to have a cutoff of september 2021 and now they've moved it up to spring of 2023 so they added in 18 months of more data which is great it's still out of date but one of the stories they used to tell, and actually I told, I was talking to an employee at OpenAI last week. I was like, you know, if you asked ChatGPT for travel advice, it might give you some places that were great in 2021 that are now war zones. So tiers out of date, it's kind of a big deal for research. So I use a lot of tools, but my core tool really is ChatGPT. It's the one that I'm the best at. I use some other specialized tools. Like I use another tool for video editing and some other things, but they constantly pull those features into ChatGPT. Like I was about to start using it for show notes, but it just does great podcast show notes. It does all these other things. Now it can listen and watch video and see images. So they're adding more and more features. So it really is the powerhouse. That's the main one that I use. And that's just part of it is because once you go to the system, you kind of want to stick with it. Got you. And so how can PR pro PR and marketing pro start to use like AI with their strategy and everything else? How can they start to use that? Because it's all great. We're like, everybody should use it, but where do they start? Yeah, that's a great place. There's two areas. I kind of take this approach with the first area is research. And the second area is kind of repetitive processes. So 
anything you do that you do over and over again, every week, you spend a lot of time doing, whether it's responding to emails, maybe if you're in PR, you send out a lot of emails about your new clients. I get a lot of emails for people that want to be guests on my podcast. I'm sure you get the same thing. I get so many cold emails that are obviously, they've used an automation process that has mistakes in it because they'll point out the wrong thing or have the wrong link for my website. Like someone sent me an email, they oh, I saw your podcast at, and then it was a link to my blog, not my podcast page. And I was like, you didn't even try. <laughs> like you didn't, you know, and these processes that we are automating in a poor way before, you can do much better now. You can speed that up. You can speed up your responses. That's one of the first places you can do is how to help you with that. If you're dealing with a lot of inbound where people message you and they want you to represent them, then you can also use it to sort that data, start to develop a criteria. Those are some of the first places to use it. The next place for most people is content generation, whether that's writing emails, writing blog posts, creating social media content. And it can either help you with coming up with ideas, if that's one of your weaknesses, or it can help you with actually creating the content. So for example, I have ChatGPT write tons of tweets for me, and then I'll just pick. I'll say, give me a list of 10 tweets on this topic, and I'll pick two or three that I like and add those to my queue. So those are some of the ways that I use it. But it really is about looking at what are things that I do that are repetitive or what are things that I'm not very good at that I have to do to support the things I am good at. Yeah. And so should people actually like check it? Because I know it's easy to be like, oh, yeah, I did it. All I have to do is send it out. But like you said before, even with the automation, there, there can be issues where it's like well, that wasn't even correct at all or it's out of date. I would always check it because... You can send something out, like if you send out an email that is offensive, you can't just go, oh, ChatGPT wrote it. They're still going to go, yeah, but you sent it. Like it doesn't give you kind of this magical protection. So one of the things to understand is that AI is not able to do anything on its own. If you leave ChatGPT to its own devices, like if you're not paying attention to the responses, it goes insane within about 13 to 15 responses. Within about five to 10 minutes, the responses are fully insane. So you cannot take your eyes off it. That's not how it works. It really is like a car. You wouldn't let a car drive itself. I mean, I know they talk about that, but every time you see that, it doesn't work out. It takes the person plus the machine to get the best results. So you want your job really shifts from doing the task to oversight. So I always, my one of my biggest methods, I always ask for three or five or 10. I'll say, write me three emails and I'll pick the one that's the best. Or write me three short descriptions. I'm always choosing and this keeps me in that mode. Instead of going, I like this or I don't like it, I need to edit it. I would rather just have it write me three emails and I pick the best one. Much easier process. Yeah. And so th there are many different tools. Like what's the best use case? For example, I use Cast Magic for show notes and it also writes additional things. I think it uses either OpenAI or Jet. GPT, which I think is the same thing, but it uses that. So is there like specific tools that will use chat GPT that they can actually use without actually going to it? Like, how does that work for marketers? Because like I said, there's a ton of tools that will use open AI and everybody's like, I don't know which one's which, what, what should I use? Most tools, probably 90 to 95% of them are using the open AI API. A few use the Anthropic Clouds API, but not very many. Every time you see an AI writer, a tool that does blog post writing or any type of writing, there it's ChatGPT. It's just a reskin. Nine, I'm hundred percent. I've never encountered one that isn't. So it's possible the one that exists. They'll say they're an AI. They often charge more. OpenAI at max is twenty dollars a month. So any tool that does writing that's more than twenty dollars a month, you know they're overcharging you. So. That's one area. There are other types of tools that can be really useful. There's a bunch of tools that are part of my tech stack that do use um, ChatGPT in different ways and they're just faster. So I have a tool that I use for running my Twitter. I have a tool I use for running my LinkedIn. There's purpose-built tools. I use a software, I'm sure you're familiar with these, that takes your my podcast or my video, long-form videos and cuts up into social media clips. I, of course, have to watch those clips to make sure that they are good. But that's another type of tool that I use that speeds up my process. Um, I use another AI that after I record a podcast like this, it edits the whole thing for me and switches back and forth to whoever's talking and creates a transcript of the show and does that heavy lifting for me. So I no longer have a video editor for my show, saves a huge amount of time, takes like 10 minutes for it to render, whereas it used to take my editor three to five days, just waiting for it to, for the turnaround time is so much faster. So 
There are some other tools that are useful and can be helpful for someone. Um, but really most tools are relying on the brain or the AI engine, which usually comes from one of the big companies. And they're all like, Claude is partially owned by Google. ChatGPT is 49% owned by Microsoft. So each company has one, you know, Twitter just came out with one, Facebook owns Llama. So they're each big company kind of has one and that's their next iteration of social media. But the real magic is looking at your process and going, this is where there's an opportunity for me, or this is an area where I have a problem. Then you look for that specific tool. So I was, I've gone through so many video editors, constantly improve my process, things that were, I was using a purpose-built tool or an Adobe Premiere add-on to do the episode editing, flipping back and forth between the speakers. And then my recording software just added as a feature. I was like, oh my gosh, now I don't need this other software that's $30 a month. So things are happening so fast that there's a new tool or there's a specific tool coming out every single week. So it's really a great time to be a buyer, especially because... OpenAI with their pricing of $20 a month and no limitations on how many questions you can ask or how many responses you get has put this massive downward pressure on what companies are charging for AI. So tools that are coming out this year are cheaper than tools that came out last year. And I think it's a really, it's like a great time to be a consumer in that way because all these softwares, I was looking at like pricing, some software like was $150 last year and now it's $39 a month this year. It's like, that's a huge difference. So it doesn't have to be expensive. That's one of the important things is you can be very lean as far as expense and get really, really good results. Gotcha. Yeah, you're right. I use a Opus Clip for the scheduling out and doing that. It does a pretty good job. I've used another one, but I think I like this one a little bit better. And yeah, the one for Adobe Premiere, unfortunately it's not for DaVinci Resolve, but I know the one you're talking about that will cut it up for you. So are you saying that Premiere just added like a feature for that as well in 2024? Riverside did. So I use Riverside, which is very comparable to Squadcast, but um, Squadcast is better because it has less lag, I've noticed, because I've used both. I use for different projects. This one, it's easier to have a conversation, whereas Riverside, there's a slight lag, but Riverside added that feature. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a crazy add-on. So every tool is adding more features. Like Descript... Originally, I was using that as my transcription tool, but now it's a video editor and also they've added features like it will make the social media clips and it does the thing where it'll make your eye look at the camera if you look away from the camera, which is like such a crazy feature. It doesn't work perfectly yet. When it does it for my eyes, it looks weird, but they're all, every tool is adding more and more features to kind of keep you on board. So there kind of is a race to add the most features, the best quality, and it's a really good thing. But yeah, um, that specific plugin, I forget what it's called. We, we were using it and then Riverside just added the feature and I was like, whoa, this is a huge add-on because it saves you so much time. Now, it used to be so hard to get transcription done a couple of years ago. I started dealing with transcription around 2016, 2017 because I have vision problems. And I used to have two full-time employees that just did transcription for me. And I've tried every tool from drag and dictate, which used to give you one out of 20 words was wrong and no punctuation. So that's a nightmare, just a giant wall of text. You have to re-edit all the way through human employees. And now everything, I end up with three or four transcripts of everything I do because then Riverside transcription is, then the YouTube creates its own transcript and then my descriptive created transcript. So it's like, I've got transcripts coming out of my ears and everyone, like everyone's making them. So what used to be hard has become easy. And then you just look at, well, which is the most accurate? Just like you're using Opus, there's probably 20 competitors. I use video, but there's not a really major difference between them, right? It's just personal taste. That's the, and that's like where we're at now. And that is like Riverside's adding it, Descript is adding it, everyone's adding those tools. So they're kind of having to compete and create new features. I know Opus just released a bunch of B-roll features, which are very interesting. I was like, oh, that's cool. I want to check that out. And I look at now, every tool is a social media schedule. Do you remember, there was no such thing as a social media schedule 10 years ago. And now it's like every tool has it and it's almost overwhelming that you're scheduling for every single tool. So tools that I used last year, I don't use anymore because there's all these really cool things coming out now that make it so much easier. Yeah, I have still have a Riverside one, but I, I think I've done Squadcast because their scheduling is better because Riverside doesn't really have a scheduling, which annoys me a little bit. 
<laughs> that's the one part where I'm like, just get a scheduler so you can use it more effectively. But no, yeah, I, I've used video, video as well. It's actually pretty good. Um, but moving back to more like PR, will this save them time? Because I mean, PR people are always looking. And the main thing for PR is finding the journalist and making sure the journalist still works there and making sure that they know what they've written so they actually pitch them the right story. Will this save them time? Because, I mean, we're all human. We all have a finite number of hours in a day. And if you're sending a bunch of emails to a bunch of different places, you're not really going to remember all that. That's a little data overload or breathing overload. This is a great question because it's very specific. I love it. So one of the best areas is for targeted research. So what you can do is feed an AI the person's name. And especially if you have a link to them on their website, say, hey, I want you to find everything by this person. What are the type of articles they're writing? How frequently are they writing? Are they writing for any other places? So this is something perplexity is better at than a chat GPT. Perplexity AI is free. They do have a $20 paid upgrade. I've never needed to upgrade because the free tool is so crazy good for research. And you can use these other tools to find the other articles they've written and say, hey, what type of style do they do? How often does this person write like negative articles, right? Because you know, some people, they that's their game. They'll write a couple of positive ones and a bunch of negative ones. You don't want to accidentally put your client in that situation where they might get a hit piece, right? On accident. Like last thing you want to do is bring that to someone. So it can do things like that and say, oh, how long has this person been writing? What type of stuff do they write? And then you go, oh, you know what? This person only does actors. Or you notice, oh, eight out of 10 articles are for actresses or six out of 10 are six singers. So you can use it in exactly that way to kind of collate the research so that you don't have to read each article and look for the similarities, which sometimes for us is like, that's a boring process, right? It's very mechanical. But to say, oh, this person hasn't written an article in six months, that's good to know. That immediately saves you time. Go, oh, they're probably not writing there anymore. They may not be writing. Maybe they've gone off to write their own book. You never know. So it can really do that where it does that actual research. One of the things you can have it do is actually read the person's book. So every, my experience is almost every journalist wants to be an author. Every author is trying to get on the news. It's like this cycle where everyone wants to be what someone else is doing. So you can have it read their book to get a sense of what they wrote about. And then you message them. You can actually be specific. Like, oh, it's interesting that your book talks about this. And this is why my client's a good fit for what you talk about. Now you've kind of hit them in a new angle. Because normally, yeah, you'll normally when you're doing a little research, you might read like their most three recent blog posts, but no one reads someone's book as part of the research. But the AI can do that. There's a bunch of free AIs, AIs that will do that. ChatGPT will do it. Claude will do it. Um, Perplexity will do it because they have a large enough memory banks. So you can do that really quickly. It's one of the things that I do is I'll have it read a book for someone's hearing my podcast and say, oh, come up with questions based on this book that I might want to ask. And then I'll choose which ones from that that I find interesting. But they're really, really good at research, really good at spreadsheet stuff, really good at data analysis, kind of figuring out what do these things have in common. And from there, you can jump off and say, hey, who are similar writers who might be a good fit for like me to pitch this person to? Yeah, I, I mean, the other thing is that PR people sometimes have to write crisis plans and are we going to have to put a little section in for AI if it goes off the rails? Because, I mean, you can say that, oh, AI did this, but I mean, it ultimately is going to be the business's fault for using the AI. So are we going to have to have a new, like, avenue for AI for crisis and make sure, like, we let it do whatever it wants because I'm pretty sure eventually it's going to get to that point. We're going to be like, uh-oh, now we have to, like, crisis that part out. Are we going to start to see that eventually? So there's a couple of specific incidents that have happened. The first is that every time someone releases a Twitter AI, people see how fast they can turn a racist. It's happened like six or seven times. Like, and people are always going to do that because to, a number, to enough people, that's funny. Whether you think it's funny or not, to enough people it is to see if you can make a robot turn bad. Just like how fast were people trying to turn chat GPT bad. So Remember Microsoft released a bot a couple of years ago, and I think they got it to say some horrible stuff within like, it wasn't a full day. They had to take it down within a day because it was saying like shocking stuff. And it's like, it shows you that an AI can be tricked. That's really the lesson in that. And um, then a couple of months ago, a lawyer went to court with a bunch of cases that ChatGPT gave him, but they weren't real. 
And he goes, but I asked Chad to be real. I was like, yeah, if someone lies to you and then you go, are you lying? They're not going to go, yes, I'm lying, right? So it goes, yeah, these are real. And he brings the, because he didn't understand the, the kind of the underpinning. So he got in a lot of trouble. He got censored and he almost lost his ability to be a lawyer. He like, got in a lot of trouble. Like the judge was not pleased. It was a really big deal. You can't just go, oh, the computer tricked me. So you will have to maintain oversight. I don't think you can blame the AI. OpenAI has said they'll cover you if you get accused of plagiarism, anything in that area, if you get sued for plagiarism. But yeah, for if it says something like messed up or something like that, that's why you do have to read it because things will slip through. You can use it for small things like keeping track of YouTube comments. Say, oh, let me know if a YouTube comment needs to be deleted because it will read them all and look for keywords. That's something it can do. But as far as like actually letting an AI write an entire press release and no human reads it, I wouldn't do that. I think that the idea that an AI can do something without human involvement, that's a big mistake. And you can see that. Like as soon as after this episode, when you run the thing through Opus Clips, at least two of them will be terrible. Probably more than that, right? Two of them you go, this is horrible. Whenever I do one, it always grabs the opening, half of the opening music. I'm like, that's not a clip anyone wants to see. It's half of the introduction, it doesn't make any sense. So AIs still are, are very error prone and it's why the human part will not disappear. So definitely a big mistake you can make is the 100% AI thing. I mean, people still do horrible stuff and then say they got hacked all the time. I don't know if everyone's getting hacked so frequently and the first thing people do is post something messed up to Twitter maybe, but I think that we're still using these kind of suspicious excuses. We don't need to switch to the AI did it yet. And you have to use it like any other tool. You still have to use it responsibly. It can't replace your intelligence. It can accelerate your intelligence, but you have to still do error correction because it will make mistakes. And that's why we still need our jobs. And so can AI help create great campaigns for marketers, for PR pros? Because I mean, the analytical side is, it seems to be like the best spot for now. I mean, eventually it'll probably get better, but the analytical side, like you said, could be great. So could it help like drive the ideation of like a great digital marketing campaign or a great awareness campaign for PR? Yeah, I use it a ton for copywriting. I use it a lot for marketing campaigns. It's really good at ideas. And there's a couple of ways to use it that are very, very creative. And I'll share a few with you. So if you say right in the style of, and then you provide a variable, you will get a, comp it will change everything. So you can say, right in the style of, and then you can just use it, the name of an actual marketer. And it will say, hey, what would so-and-so, famous marketer, do for this campaign? And it will come up with something and you can change the name of the marketer. If you don't know famous marketers, you say, who are the top 10 marketers of all time? What it will tell you is the 10 marketers as the most data on. So then you just go through all 10 until you find one you like. I do this with copywriters, I also do this with brands. So I'll write, as I write this sales letter in the style of Harley Davidson, and immediately you're going to see the word um, open road a lot, sunset a lot, um, freedom a lot. And then sometimes you have to do a negative and say, but well, don't use the name of any specific motorcycles or motorcycle parts. Because it will start talking about like a dovetail this and a feather, like specific motorcycles, which is not what you want because you're talking about motorcycles. But now it has an Americana way of talking and it doesn't sound like a specific person. If you say talk like Apple... Apple's put out a lot of ads in the last 40 years since they started in the early 80s, right? So you have a language that's completely different. And you can go through really big brands and capture their language in that way. So you could pull in a lot of different ideas, whether they're talking about specific using specific marketers, specific copywriters, or specific um, brands. Those are some of the ways that I quickly create a really different answer. And then again, that's a fast way to do it. I'll say, I'll go through 10 and then I'll just pick my favorite and that does 90% of the work for me. So the secret is knowing that ChatGPT has too much data, not too little. So what I'm actually trying to do is eliminate everyone else except Harley Davidson or everyone else except Apple or everyone else except McDonald's and use just this one data set. Same thing when I narrow it down to one author or one copywriter. I'm saying don't use other copywriters because here's the thing. If you say design a commercial, most commercials are bad, right? Most commercials fail because the majority of commercials are local commercials. Just like most websites are bad. 99% of websites, no one's ever seen them. They were made in like the 1990s. The GeoCities websites, those angel websites, I forget what they're called, or the AOL websites. 
they're all bad, right? They used to play music as soon as you visited the website, it was flashing colors, it would make you dizzy. But if you narrow out and say, don't include those, just include this successful brand or this successful website as a successful person, now it's using a data set that all has good data and you're getting a much better response. Got you. And so, I mean, for that, could you actually, for PR pros and marketers, could you actually have chat GPT create your own brand voice for you? Maybe you do like do similar to this, or this is what I want the voice to be. And could it help you with that? Because maybe you don't want to sound too much like Apple because everybody'd be like, well, that was Apple. And you're like, ah, never mind. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, you can merge voices and create your own custom voice. You can say, oh, here's the things I like, here's the things I don't like, especially now with the release of GPTs, which is where you can create your own custom character or custom, they call it a GPT, which is kind of annoying because it's a GPT inside of a GPT, like don't give it a name. But basically this is what I do a lot of is I create really specific characters that are experts at certain things, have a certain way of talking. So I call them cyber staffers. The name doesn't really matter. It's just what you call it is I have one that's like a younger girl who does Twitter. I mean, does linked uh, TikTok. She's annoying because she talks very fast. She talks in 30 second bits. She talks in seven second bits, but she's really good at TikTok. The lady who does my LinkedIn, she's mid thirties. She's a little more of business. She has a different way of talking. And in between, I have my Twitter expert who is not that annoying, but she's always happy, which sometimes you don't want, but that's how you want to post on Twitter to resist the urge to post negative. So there's separate personalities that have separate expertises that speak in a different voice. So you can create a skill chain, a personality using the big five personality type, which is the OCEAN personality. You can give it a specific personality. And you can also create a custom voice, which says, oh, you talk about these things, but you don't talk about those things. You kind of are, and you can feed in those different brands that you like and the brands that you don't like, and that will create a really customized voice. And when you do that, that's when you get something really magical, something really amazing that no one else has. It's completely unique. Gotcha. And what would you say for like those that are hesitant about AI? Cause that, cause this is still pretty new for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people are used to doing it all by hand or by search. Google search was the first, I guess, AI, but very basic. So what would you say for those that are hesitant? Like, I don't know about this. I don't want to make it feel like that I'm not really working because people can actually probably suit or surmise that people may not be working. You're just giving it to AI. You're not really doing much. So what would you say to those people that are hesitant about using it right now? So AI is not a replacement. It's an accelerator. So I can write software. I've written several pieces of software using AI, but I will never write software as good as a developer who's using the same AI, right? I can create images with an AI image generator, but an artist will create better images. I'm a really good writer. I write books. I've written a lot of books. I've written several hundred bestsellers. So with AI, I can write amazing books, but it's because it's accelerating what I'm already really good at. So whatever you're good at, it makes you faster and more efficient. What it And it can take, if you're a low skill person, it can bring you up to like an okay. But it can't take you from zero to 10. Like it can't make me a 10 out of 10 PR person. But if you're a 10 out of 10 PR person, it can make you 40% faster. I understand the hesitancy because we think of it, oh, this is gonna replace people, but not really. What it's actually doing is making everyone a little better at their jobs. What's really happening in this shift right now is the people who adopt early are getting faster. And we go through these phases. The phases we go through is first, it's like, oh my gosh, look at this new tech. Then we go, it's cheating. Then we go, okay, it's allowed. And then we go, it's mandatory. If we look at calculators, when calculators came out and became affordable in the early 70s, there were people who said, how can a kid learn math if they're allowed to use a calculator? Then what happened? They go, oh, a few years later, go, okay, you're allowed to use calculator in class, but not during the test. Then it was, okay, you can use calculator during the test. Now, when I went to high school in the 90s, calculator required. You had to have a graphing calculator. They, they gave you a list of choices of which one to have, and you had to have it because you had to do the things. I never learned how to draw like a cosine graph by hand because I learned how to do it on the graphing calculator, and that was good enough. In fact, we would show on the graphing calculator, and if it had the right picture, you'd get the points. Same thing happened with Google, right? It was like, oh, you're not allowed to use Google in school. Then it was like, okay, you're, you're supposed to, you're expected to use, expected to use your cell phone. And it's the same thing with AI. 
We're going to go through, it's not allowed at school, it's cheating, to, okay, you're allowed to do it, but not during the test, to now it's mandatory. Because what we want to do is have people that are good at using AI to do their jobs. Nobody would hire an accountant who says, I don't use calculators, right? Would you trust a bookkeeper who goes, I don't do spreadsheets, I do it by hand? You're like, what? Because that's really your choice. You can have a PR person who can do 10 things a day or one who can do 50. Of course, you're going to hire the second person. Now, there is the fear of a, dro a drop in quality, which I completely understand. That's why you have to oversight. So you can say, oh, it's written 50 emails. I'm going to read all 50 before they go out. That saves you the time because you can read faster, you can write. That's really where the magic happens, where you don't give up the thing you're really good at. You don't want to give that up, but then you go, I'm going to do more of that. I don't need to write every email. I can go through and just tweak each one to make it a little better. I don't need to do all the research. I could just double check this to make sure it's right. That's where you get really fast. Like I had an AI edit my last book. Why? Because that's a huge amount of time saving. I don't need to spell every word right and worry about that because ChatGPT always spells every word right, doesn't make grammatical mistakes. So it solves that problem. I still read through it because sometimes it may change. I go, no, no, you're drifting. I still read every single word to make sure it didn't go off track. So you're still involved. That's really where the magic comes. It's all about seeing it as the working together. On its own, AI can't really do anything. And on your own, you're limited by your ability and by time. Working together, you can accelerate. Hmm. And where do you see the impact of AI coming in the next five years? Sure, I think there's going to be the people who think it's a fad. Most of them are going to be unemployed in three to five years. They're just going to be replaced by people who learn to use AI. Because why would you hire someone who can't use a calculator, right? And that's one of the worries I have for people that don't take it seriously, because this is right now we're in the optional phase. People go, oh, it's cool if you learn it. There are already people who are getting raises based on their knowledge of AI. People are already talking about, oh, I got a 20% raise because I'm good at AI. I got a 40% raise because I'm good at AI. That's a lot of money, right? 20%, 40% single raise. This is over the last six months. That's a huge difference. So it's already happening. And then there's going to be companies that the same thing happens. They go, oh, we're not, we're old school. We're not going to get involved in that. And what's going to happen is that it's the same thing like all the companies that 20 years ago, 30 years ago said, oh, we don't need a website. What happened to them? They're gone. They went out of business, right? Then what happened? All the companies said, oh, we don't do social media. They all do it now, right? Everyone's advertising on Facebook and Twitter and whatever. Like they're all over every platform. Why? Because it's not really optional. So we are in the phase right now where it's a big opportunity. It's wide open market for people to learn. You can be the first person in your company or the first person in your market, your first person in your area to get good at these tools. It's a massive advantage over the competition, but eventually they're going to shift from optional to, you're going to see this when you see like job postings, it's going to start going like, oh, AI skills, a plus. Then it's going to switch to AI skills mandatory. That's what's going to happen. That's where you're going to see it first. And that's where it's going to be really scary for people who've lost their job. And now they're seeing every job in their market has AI skills mandatory. Now they got to go back and try and catch up on three years of everyone else learning. The cool thing right now is no one has more than a year of AI skills. Anyone who tells me they have three years of experience in AI, I go, no, you don't. Nothing about AI from 2020 is useful, right? Nothing from last year matters. Anything pre-chat GB 3.5 is irrelevant because it's been replaced by everything happening this year. The cool thing is no one has a massive advantage. I only have like an eight, eight months more experience than anyone else. That's not a huge insurmountable advantage. And that's why it's really actually a big opportunity. People who see it as an opportunity who are going to accelerate and it's the people who think it's a fad who are going to kind of suffer the most, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so let's say for those already into their career and having to pivot, how, how should they start to pivot? Because I feel like the younger people are going to be a little bit easier to be like, oh yeah, I'll just try this out. But it's mostly the older ones, the seasoned professionals are like, nope, I've done this way. I will not change whatever people say. I can do it better. So how can they pivot to that with all of the all the knowledge that they have as well? The cool thing about ChatGPT is it's a really low learning curve. The bad thing with all of these AIs is it seems really hard because they have no onboarding process. So I tell most people who go through my program or that I deal with, if you just read my book or watch a bunch of YouTube videos to say, I'm going to spend one day, I'm going to give this eight hours and I'm going to put up with this and I'm going to go, 
I, and I don't care if the AI thinks I'm stupid. If you let go of that fear of the AI judging you, which I used to feel that way too. Like, I don't want to ask a stupid question or write a stupid prompt. If you let go of that, you can learn it in eight hours, in one day. One business day, you can become a skilled user. That's what's really cool. It seems really hard because they don't offer any onboarding. And I know that and I know why they do that. But I also know that you can get past all of that very quickly. So it takes one day to become a pretty good user. And just playing around with it, just trying prompts, just watching some YouTube videos. You can grab my book, whatever. You don't have to, but you can. And that's a, all you need to get started. That's how I started. I just watched a ton of YouTube videos. I go, oh, I think I can do that. And then I said, oh, you know what? I think I can do that better. And that's really how I kind of push myself up is that I kind of have this ideas and then I test them. I go, I could do this better. I can do that better. I can tweak this. I can tweak that. That's where all the magic happens. So once you have that approach, that's the real game changer. It doesn't take a long time to learn it. And you can just try and go, oh, it's good at this. And not, it's not good at that. So I'm constantly discovering new things that it can do because they're updating it all the time. They don't tell you. So when I first tested it, I said, how many programming languages do you know? And ChatGPT told me five programming languages. Then I asked it two months later, it listed 14. I was like, you haven't told anyone that you learned nine new languages. You only know if you ask. And now I'm sure it's even more, probably dozens now. So they're always adding new features, always adding new skills. And really, it's just about learning a new way to use a tool. I know it seems daunting, but compared to learning some of the software that's out there now, that's so much harder, like, Trying to explain to someone how to use Facebook from the ground up, it's unbelievable, right? Facebook has so many features and groups and pages. Like trying to explain the difference between a group and a page to me, I still don't get it. Like, right? It's like, what is happening here? There's so many complex things. There's a Facebook event. This is a different type of event and all these integrations. Here's where you upload a picture. Here's where you upload a business picture. This is a real, this is a, like all of this stuff. It's really complicated compared to that. The idea that it's basically like a small person that can help you with tasks. If you just think of it as like an assistant, then it's not so daunting. It just, it seems scarier than it is because most of the content online is like, look at all these crazy things you can do. Robot that goes out and does all the work. Like, you don't need all that. What you just need is something that goes, oh, you know what? This does something a little faster for me. Instead of having to read all the articles, this will read the articles for me and give me the highlights. Stuff like that is where you can start with just summarizing and doing those faster. And you start there and you look at what you do every week and go, hey, what do I do that's repetitive and that I can replace? That's really how I approach it, is replacing either the things I'm not very good at that are, that are kind of next to my area of excellence. And I look at things that are repetitive that I just can save time. That's where I would start. Gotcha. And should they test out Bard and chat GPT just so they know like, because I mean, I'm pretty sure some people may like Bard over Jet GPT. Not saying you, anyone's better or not, but should they try out all of them and figure out which one works for their better workflow? Absolutely. You should try Bard. You should try Claude. You should try Perplexity and you should try Chat GPT. And maybe I hate the name. I don't know why they call it Grok from Twitter, like that, or from X, like the change in the name of everything. So that one might turn out to be good. I don't know. Because that one is going to be fed all the data of every tweet anyone's ever written, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, probably a bad thing, but not the best data set. But if you want to be good at Twitter, I guess that's a great place to use it. But I would try them all and see if there's one that's intuitive to you. I just got lucky that ChatGPT is very intuitive to me. It's not going to be that way for most people. But I know people that really love Claude and hate ChatGPT. They each work a slight different way. I really love Perplexity. I find it really easy to use. I think it's actually more user-friendly than any of the other ones because it's really simple and what it does, it just does research, but it does it very well. And it gives you all of its notes in a really professional way. It says, oh, this article came from here, here's the highlight. This article came from here, here's the highlight. So I would try them all out, see which one you feel good about, and then spend one day learning it. You just spend one day, you can master it. It's really all it takes. And then, because it's conversational, once you get comfortable talking to it, you can get better and better and better and just become a master over time. Gotcha. And so where can people find you online? Sure, you can find out everything about me by just Googling serve no master. So that's my website. That's my everything, my first book. And that will give you everything. And if you go to servedmaster.com forward slash master, I'll give you for free my master prompt, which really switches ChatGPT into question and answer mode so that it will do the heavy lifting, kind of shows my formula for that to make it really easy for beginners. All right. Any final thoughts for listeners? I'm excited that you're here. This is a great topic and showing that AI is really going to 
kind of affect every different industry. And that if you see it as something, oh, this is a tool that can help me do things a little bit faster, save me a little bit of time, that's really the right way to see it, not something that's going to take your job away because it's not going to be replacing very many jobs. All right. Thanks, John, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on AI. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining. As always, please subscribe to this podcast on all your favorite podcasting apps. And join us next month when we talk about what's going on in the PR industry and talking to great colleagues at the same time. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding how AI can better help your workflow. And see you next month. Later.